Well, as Rachel already let, uh, let us know so well, happy Father's Day uh, as well for myself. And dads, we, uh, we're so, it's just great to be together. I see some uh, dads in the house, some dads visiting with their family who are, attend Resonate Church. We're just so glad that you're here. And I want to just uh, say we love you so much. We value you. Uh, we lift you up in honor in this place this morning. And uh, I just love the way God designed family. I love that he had some stuff that he wanted to give to your kids. Uh, and he decided that a bunch of that he was going to get to them through you. Spiritual DNA, character. Uh, God allows us into that process in our kids' lives. And I'm just, I love the way God does that. So it is an honor to be a dad. But as Rachel said, it's also sometimes a little bit of a, a sacrifice. Sometimes it's a little bit of a, a price to pay. I was talking to George here this morning and he was saying that they, he was up at 2 a.m. as well. We should have just been like FaceTiming. I was like, well, where were you on that one? We should just know, right? Like, just... Uh, This week, actually, our family was feeling a little bit sick. The girls, kind of all of us were, were sick at some point this week. And I remember there was one night, you know, sometimes as a parent, when you're in that place where everyone's sick, your favorite time of day is bedtime. You're just like, you get to bedtime, you're just like, it's the greatest feeling in the world. And so we were there, and I got into bed on this night, and it just felt so good. You know, you kind of get the pillow next to your head. You're like, ah, this is the greatest thing in the whole world right now. And I'm lying there in bed, and I think of Avia's sinuses and the fact that she's so plugged up. And as I'm lying there in bed, and I'm starting to just get warm, and I'm almost asleep, I'm like, you know what would be really good for her would be a humidifier. And so I get myself out of bed, and I go to the closet, and I dig out a humidifier, and I go in and put it in her room. And then I'm making my way back to our bedroom. And then as I'm walking, I'm like, you know, what would be good in addition to the humidifier is if I were to put some essential oils in there. Because I'm strong, but I'm also sensitive. And <laughs> so I go, and I whip up some sort of essential oil concoction, make it smell nice. And I'm making my way back to the room, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of picturing Rachel like just sitting up and being like, you, you know, you're the husband of the year. I just, I, want, I wanted that moment, because I will eat up words of affirmation like candy. Don't judge me, it's just, it's my love language, and so I'm like, I know she's, she's going to have something for me. She was asleep, but I was expecting it anyway. So as I'm walking back to the room, I had this thought, this realization. It was, you know, even though I was doing something that took more strength than I felt like I had in that moment, I realized it was the best I'd felt all day. And I think it's amazing that God puts that heart in us. He puts his heart in us. So that the best life we can live is the life that's serving others. God puts that, he just the, the, the best feeling we can have is knowing that we're getting to serve and, and make a difference in someone else's life. And that's basically the life of being a dad all the time. And so dads, we love you. Again, we honor you. We're so thankful for you. One more time, can we just give it up for the dads? I know this is like, can't do this enough. We're in week number three of a message series called My Story, and uh, this is a series on growing our faith, that God wants to grow your faith. He's not content to just leave you, bring you into the kingdom of God, get you saved and forgiven of your sins, and then just leave you where you are. No, God always had in mind a journey that he wanted to lead you on, and that journey is a journey of growing faith, increased faith, and so what we're talking about in this series is ways that God grows our faith. He's committed to the growth and development of your faith, and our theme text for the series has been Hebrews 11, verse 6, which says that without faith, it's actually impossible to please God because those who come to him must believe that he exists, number one, but secondly, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And I love this, that God actually is pleased when you show up to church with some expectation, right? When you show up here on a Sunday morning and you're like, I believe that God as I diligently and passionately press into who he is, I actually believe that he wants to pour something into my life, that he wants to bless me, that he's a rewarder. Sometimes we, you know, we think that that would be selfish living, and the Bible actually says to us here, it pleases the heart of God to know that you not only believe he exists, but that you actually can see who he is and understand his nature and lean in and come with some expectation. So is there anybody here this morning, you got a little expectation in your heart. Come on, the culture of this house, as we get involved, we shout down the preacher, not because I need you to, but because 
when you actually engage with what I'm saying just on some sort of like physical level, whether it's just like, you know, if you brought a hanky, that's fine. You know, if dads, if you got like one with your initials on it, you know, you just want to wave it because they invested in that for you, whatever the case may be. But let's, let's, let's lean into God's word today with an expectation. Now, that theme of this series, my story, this actually was birthed out of some conversations I had with some friends of mine who, uh, who were not Christians. And when I, we were hanging out earlier in the year, and what I found was as we're hanging out, they would ask my, my friends that don't, uh, that wouldn't call themselves Christians, they ask amazing questions. I remember I had this one friend said to me, he said, hey, if I was to become a Christian, what would I be saying yes to? And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> Uh, I'm a pastor, but I'm not sure I really feel like I can answer that question. That's a big one right there. Uh, that's a, you know what I mean? Like you just you ever have a friend just ask you a question and you're like, that, you know, is, is pretty much the most massive thing you could ever throw my way. So here's what I did. I just started to answer with my story. I love giving theological answers. I, you know, I've got a theological understanding of what it means to be a Christian. But sometimes what people just need to hear is your story. And what I love about the Bible is it reveals Jesus taught this way. When people would come to Jesus with a question, he would give a theological answer, but then he would always turn it into some sort of story or illustration or some way to make it come alive for people. And I've been sharing one of these each week of this series. And so there's this one time in the Bible where Jesus is having a conversation with a Jewish man and he's he's asking, well, what do I need to do to be saved or to get eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what's what's the Bible say? It's a good, good response back to him. And the man nails it out of the park. He says, first of all, uh, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. He gets it like he, right away. Love God, love people. He's on it. He nails it. So then he says to Jesus, back to, you know, he says, well, who's my neighbor? So Jesus could have given like a really detailed answer, of, or, or, you know, of what a neighbor uh, would, would look like. Or he could have just said, you know, uh, your neighbor is everybody. But Jesus wanted to bring it to this man's doorstep. Jesus wanted to bring it straight to this man's grill. And so he said back to him uh, this story. And uh, he said, there's a man that, and you know, if you've been around church, you'll know the story is the parable of the Good Samaritan. There's a man who's robbed and he's left by the side of the road and he's bleeding and he's harmed and and he can't take care of himself. And two priests or in our vernacular, a couple pastors walk by on the other side of the road and they don't stop to do anything to help him out. But then a, a Samaritan comes along. And again, in our culture, this might not mean too much to you, but uh, Samaritans believed differently than, than Jews. Samaritans uh, had, they'd wronged one another historically. And so I want you to think for a moment of the person that you would most easily judge. Like if you, if you were to judge someone, and we all, you know, there's a part of us that judges rather quickly. It's a bit of a reflex for us. Uh, so who would you judge? You want to think about someone maybe who has a different belief structure than you, or maybe has a different moral, ethical ethos than you. Maybe you want to think of someone who's harmed you in the past. Who is it easy for you to judge? Jesus makes that person the hero in this story. What Jesus is wanting to do is he's wanting to bring right to this man's doorstep the realization that, hey, if you're going to follow me, here's what it looks like. It means that you lay down your moral superiority. If you're going to follow Jesus, listen, understand, we believe in God's word. We believe it is true. We believe Jesus is the only way to the Father. But understand, when we're dealing with people that don't believe what we believe, we don't come from a moral superior place. No, we serve people in love. If you're going to love people, don't just love them when they believe the same thing that you do. Don't just love them when they look like you. Don't just love them when they show up and act like you. Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, you can believe what you believe, but everybody better understand that you're, you're, you're interacting in the world from a place of servitude and, and, and heart for everyone and love for people. And that's the, that's the heart and culture of this church. Come on, somebody. That when you walk in this place, you don't need to look down at your shoes because you don't act like somebody here. You actually don't need to wear a jacket, although I'm wearing one on Father's Day, right? Because I just wanted to roll that way. Uh, but you can, you can roll in with a ripped t-shirt. You understand? You can walk in smelling like Saturday night. Come on, somebody. That's the culture and heartbeat of this house. And there's a series called My Story. God wants to build our faith. That was all just to tell you that Jesus uses a story. That had nothing to do with the message this morning. Like, that's not even what I'm preaching about. I just wanted to illustrate Jesus uses a story. And so what I wanted this series to be like is, is if you and I could sit down and I wish that we could do this, uh, that we could actually sit down and have coffee. We could sip some lattes. Thank you, Jesus, for caffeine and for Starbucks and for J.J. Bean and for early opening hours on those times when you need it. 4.30 a.m. opens. Thank you, Jesus, because we're having another baby. Did anyone hear that last week? If you weren't here. I've been thinking a lot about coffee since we found that out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. 
That is funny. Someone said minivan from about the third row, and I just like, I, I don't receive that. I don't receive it. <laughs> I mean, if you have a minivan, go for it, right? But uh, we're just going to get some really narrow car seats. We're going to do it. <laughs> My story. My story. If I was to sit with you over coffee, and I was to be given the opportunity to share with you the five ways that God has grown my faith over the last 20 years. These are the things I would talk about. In week one, uh, in week one we talked about practical teaching. That when, when the Bible, this is why we show up here week after week, year after year, that there's a consistency to pressing into the to church. That not just the teaching, there's other elements, there's the community, there's the worship, it's, you know, there's the service. Uh, there's outreach, there's all that church represents, but there's something about being in the house of God to hear practical teaching, to hear the word of God taught in a way that you can actually apply to your life. Practical teaching will grow your faith. We don't teach the whole Bible every single week, but if you show up over the next 20 years, you're going to hear God's word taught in its fullness, in its entirety. That's why, we, that's why we do what we do. Practical teaching, God uses it to grow our faith. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. So that was week number one. And in week number two, we talked about personal ministry, that God's going to grow your faith, not just by doing stuff for you, but actually by doing things through you. See, there's an element of your faith growth that you cannot get any other way than serving somebody else. There's an element of your faith growth that you can't get. There's an element of understanding who God is that you can't grasp until you are his hands and his feet. And so God wants to use you in personal ministry and, uh, let, me, let, let that just be a plug to growth track again. Our next steps, we call it, it around here. If you've not yet jumped in, man, the whole thing is designed so that you could have an on-ramp to effective personal ministry. And we believe it's not, listen, we are never going to stand up here in front of you and say, we need six people for the nursery. No, we believe God put a gift on your life. I actually pray and ask God to send leaders to this house. And then I just trust the gift he put on your life when it's used in its best place. It just, it is where it is. God's, God's going to send all that he needs to this house. Because I understand that some of you, you just like serving others in hot blazing sun, like serving is one of your spiritual gifts. God just put, and some of you, you don't even understand that. Because like, you know, for you, it's, it's, it's like empathy and compassion. So you see someone sitting by themselves. You run to them. You don't understand the person that actually wants to be out in 30-degree heat holding a sign. You're like, I can't even, I would burn out. Like, you love our church. This is a thing, like, if, if, if I went to church and, and, and a pastor or a leader was like, hey, we need someone at the road, I would go to the road with a sign, right? Because I just love church and I would do whatever it took. But I would, I would eventually burn out because it's not what, you know, it's not the gift on my life. But I love watching guys like Colin, who is up here playing guitar this morning. And I put it up on my Instagram. I couldn't even tag him because he's too cool to be on Instagram, but that's fine. <laughs> this guy comes in and every single week, it's like he's trying to outserve everybody. This guy, he will, he will, he, I drive away every single week looking at Colin in my rear view mirror. Why? Because there's something about this guy that wants to be in this place until the job gets done. Again, this is not, I'm, like, we haven't even really, we haven't even got to week three, right? We're just, the recap is, I'm getting chills, because this is just God, how God grows your faith, how God builds you up. God has a plan and a purpose. God always wants to lead you on a journey. Where you are today is not where he wants you to be. God's got a journey for you. He will do it through practical teaching, personal ministry. And here we are, week number three, 15 minutes into the message. We are getting to what I want to talk about today. Glory to God. <laughs> Today I want to talk to you about impossible miracles. Oh man, impossible miracles. That there's an element of your faith. God, God never wants to anchor your faith on experience, right? He never wants your theology to be dictated by what you've experienced. But God does want to attest to who he is through power, through signs, and through wonders. It's what he does. It's who he is. He's, he's a God of power. He's a God of might. I thought maybe I'd get a little bit back from you on that one, but... Uh, We'll start to preach it down a little bit stronger, I guess. He's a God of power, and he's a God of might. You were just waiting for my voice to give you that little, like, cue. This is what the Apostle Peter is. The day of Pentecost is the first message in, in, of, ever of the Christian faith after Jesus has died and rose again. And he said this in Acts 2.22. He said that the ministry of Jesus was attested. I love that word, attested. Like God is like, I'm showing you I'm who I say I am. Attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. So we serve a God of power. We serve a God who still does miracles. We serve a God who shows up in our lives in ways that we just look and we have to say, 
There's no way that was anything but you. And when I sit with my friends who don't know Jesus, honestly, I so want to steer the conversation to those things that God has done in my life that just, there's no way they could be anything but God. And, you know, I'll share one, and they'll be a little bit skeptical. Well, they, you know, that could have been a coincidence. And then I'll share another one. They're like, oh, that's a bit like, trickier. And then I'll share. Then I'll start talking about how the fact that we have, we're going to have a, a, a third baby uh, when we were told that we would never have kids, right? So as, as the stories begin to pile up of God being God and doing the miraculous in our lives, it becomes part of our story and part of the thing that anchors and builds our faith. It's not the only thing, but God attests to who he is through power and through science. Peter also said this to the church. He said this in 1 Peter 2. He said that, that here's what Jesus did on the cross. He said, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you were healed. And this is what we believe about healing. This is what we believe about miracles in this church. That on the cross, Jesus not only paid for your freedom from sin. Please understand, that is the preeminent. That is what Jesus died for, was to forgive you. But Peter here says that Jesus did more than that, that, that by his wounds you were healed. And this word healed here in the New Testament is only ever used to refer to physical healing. So he's not just saying that your emotions got healed and your past got healed. He's saying on the cross of Jesus Christ, there, it, there was healing paid for for your physical body. And can we just dig into that text a little bit? Are you with me? A little, little uh, text uh, a little text dig. So Peter is actually quoting the prophet Isaiah. 800 years before Jesus, Isaiah says, by his stripes, you are healed. Now here's Peter on the other side of the cross, and, he's, and he changes one word. He intentionally misquotes Isaiah. He says, by his wounds, you have been healed. You were healed. He changes the tense of a word and he does it intentionally. You see, Isaiah is on this side of the cross looking forward to what God would do and prophetically speaking and says that by his stripes that you are healed. Peter's on the other side of the cross. He's looking back and he's saying, everything that needs to be done for your physical healing was done at the cross of Jesus Christ. You don't have to earn it by your good works. You don't earn it by, uh, by your own effort, by the intensity of your prayer. No, what was, done, what was needed for your healing was accomplished on the cross of Jesus Christ. So this changes the way that we pray. This is how I think that we should pray as a church. This ought to be the culture of prayer that we, that we, um, that we uh, grow and build in this church. It's to pray like this. Um, and it's not about the words. It's really about the, the heart and the understanding. It's to say, let's say we're praying for Sally. Um, God, we pray for Sally. We pray uh, today believing that it is your will to heal. And we pray this, God, knowing that on the cross of Jesus Christ, you paid for her healing. And we believe today is a great day for a miracle. So here's what we believe as a church. We believe that God has paid for your healing. And so whether it's today or whether it's tomorrow or whether it's in eternity, God's going to get it done. God's already done it. This is what Revelation says. Revelation says that, that in eternity, death is no more, neither shall there be mourning, crying, nor pain anymore. So God is going to take care of all physical ailment, disease, sickness. The, uh, the psalmist David said, uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all my iniquities and who heals all my diseases. Well, you look at that and you say, well, I see people who die of diseases all the time. We pray for them and, and they don't get healed. So how can David say, you heal all my diseases? David looks and he says, well, whether it's today or tomorrow or in eternity, God heals all diseases. So that's the way we pray. And so we don't, we don't, we don't pray with some like wishy-washy prayer. We say, this is what you do and who you are. And I believe I have a responsibility to just pray, today let your kingdom come. Today let your will be done. This is a great day for a miracle. Now here's, like, I can't, can't be honest with you. I haven't always prayed that way. Like pastoral confession moment. Just three and a bit years ago, when Rachel's mom passed away, 54 from the age of cancer, and we prayed, and we saw God do miracles, like God extended her life again and again and again beyond what the doctors said was going to be possible. God, she had uh, six tumors on her brain. Two of them were hemorrhaging. They gave her hours to days to live. She lived for 15 months. And not only that, God restored her brain to the place that she came back cognitively, was able to spend time with Avia, our firstborn, was able to interact. God brought her back in ways that doctors said. And so as I saw God working healing, I, I, was, I, I presumed that we were going to get to see the full healing in this life. Because we kept seeing God heal. We kept seeing God 
when, when the diagnosis was, it's, this is it, we kept seeing God extend her life. And so we're like, well, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And then it didn't happen. And so then I went into a season where I actually began to pray. I would still pray for people, but this is what was going on in the back of my mind. I'd say, God, I just pray that you would heal them. But in the back of my mind, I'm being honest with you, I'm thinking, yeah, but I'm not sure you're going to. And maybe that's how you'd pray today. Maybe you've prayed that way. Maybe you know what that's like to pray that way. Maybe that's where your heart would even be as you prayed it. I love this story from a Pastor Rob Ketterling. He's a pastor we have a relationship with through the Association of Related Churches. He's on the ARC lead team. ARC planted our, uh, we planted our church through ARC just a little bit over a year ago, about maybe 16 months ago now. And so we've got strong connection with ARC. And he tells this story. Um, he tells a story of his son being born with autism and praying for years for him to be healed. And there was a season where he had great faith, but then he hit this season where his faith kind of wavered. And even himself, he would say as he prayed for people, he would have that same sort of thing because he would prayed so much for his son. He would be praying for people in his church and he'd be like, God, heal them. But, but the same sort of thing going on for him, like that talk in the back of the mind, just not sure if you're going to do this. And so he kind of got to the place where even though he would verbalize prayers, his, his heart really wasn't anchored in what God does in a, in a security in God being a healer. And so... Uh, one day, a, a guest speaker came to their church, River Valley Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and, and asked what he could pray for for them. And Pastor Rob wanted to ask him to pray for the church, but his wife got in first and said, would you pray for our son who, who uh, is on the autism spectrum? And so this guy said, yeah, I'd be happy to pray. And so he prayed, gets to the end of the prayer, and as Pastor Rob tells the story, his son looked up at him the moment the prayer was done, which was bizarre because... Because of where he was at on the spectrum, eye contact was not something that they would regularly see. They began to notice that day there was significant differences in the interaction that they had. So then he took him to school and to his class that was designed for kids with his, his cognitive abilities. He asked the teacher to do an assessment, which she did. She came back to him and she said, I can't find any signs of autism in your son anymore. She'd worked with him for years. She knew his cognitive abilities. So she was so blown away, she decided she would get her boss to do the same test. She got her boss to do the test. Her boss has a meeting with Rob and says, your son doesn't have autism. How dare you waste the resources of this class? And he's like, well, because, you know, every parent's dream would be to take, you know, like, how, what do you mean? <laughs> how I re waste the resources? This is a miracle. Only God could do this. God still does miracles. And how about the goodness of God? God even does a miracle in this case where the father's faith is weak. He's just like, and, and, and maybe you're there today. Maybe you're like, I just don't even know what I believe anymore, and, and uh, I don't know how I would even pray. This is what the Apostle Paul said when he told the Ephesian church how he prayed for them. I love this. He, he said to them, he said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know. And then he goes on to talk about hope. He says, in order that you may know your inheritance that God's got for you. And then he prays, in order that you may know his inco incomparably great power for those of us who believe. That power, it's like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead. Notice, Paul is not praying for the church to have power. He's praying that the church would have their eyes open to the power they've already got inside of them because they're followers of Jesus Christ. And that's my prayer for you today. Not that you would have power, but that you would understand in Jesus Christ, you have power. You have power for your family. You've got power in faith, in prayer, believing for miracles. That's why we say, God, it's not our, it's not our responsibility to decide when and where and how God works. It is our responsibility to say, today your kingdom come. Today your will be done. Today is a great day for somebody's miracle. Today might even be your day for a miracle. When I got to phone my pastor this week, Pastor Brent Cantillon, I know a lot of you know him, um, I got to tell him, as we said already, that we were expecting our third child, and, and a lot of people have been really excited about that for us, but Pastor Brent was, like, ecstatic, like, to the point where I'm like, don't post this on your Instagram, like, do not <laughs> take this news, I get in trouble for some people that I still haven't told yet personally, just, like, calm yourself down because he was so pumped and here's the reason he was so excited is that so many times during our journey of infertility he would pull me aside he put his arm around me say let me pray for you to have a miracle baby 
God still does miracles. And so when I tell my story to my friends that don't have a relationship with Jesus, our kids, our miracle babies, all of them, they're at the top of the list. The story I share at Next Steps in step number one about a financial miracle, and I'm just going to leave it at that. It is worth going to Next Steps for. It's just like getting paid to not show up to a job, and they knew I had quit. So just show up to Next Steps for that one. Uh, That one's also near the top of the list. But as I was praying for what stories to share today, from my story of God doing impossible miracles. God reminded me of one I've never told from a platform before. In fact, I I don't very often think about it, but it changed the trajectory of my life. So when I was 19 years old, I went to work on cruise ships, and I had had a strong faith through my teen years. But I was like a lot of young adults as you're transitioning from high school into young adult living, I was beginning to question, am I missing out on something? Because the world is just screaming, your identity is connected to who you have sex with, and real freedom comes when you drink enough to forget about all the junk going on in your life. That message comes very loud and very strong to a young adult, especially as you step out of high school and kind of out of your parents' home. So I began to wonder, like, am I missing out on something? And as I was making my way to that first cruise ship, I actually made up in my mind, I'm going to try out the stuff that the, the world is telling me is better. I made my way to the, the cruise ship, and very early on in my stay on that ship, I remember this one night where God showed up, and the best I can describe it is to say that God showed up in my dream in a way that I'd never experienced before then, in a way I've never experienced since. I still remember the dream vividly. In the dream, I was in a church service, like the worship service we had this morning, right? It was just like amazing time in the presence of God. But it was a room full of thousands of people. I can still picture the room. It wasn't a church I'd been to. It was just a, a picture God was giving me in my dream. And so I'm, I'm there. I'm in this worship experience. And it gets to the point, like, I can hardly speak. Just the presence of God is so rich and so real and so confirming of who God is in my life. And I woke up. And the, again, the best I can describe it is I didn't wake up knowing that I'd had a dream. I woke up as if that dream had been real. Like, I woke up with the feeling I would have had walking out of that service, like I had just encountered the presence of God. It was as if God showed up in the midst of me walking away and turning my back and saying, I'm going to turn towards the world. And God showed up in the middle of a dream and said, I'm going to show you that I got more for you than anybody else has for you. It's like God showed up in the midst of me turning my back and saying, I'm going to show you that this life with me is better than anything else you could experience. And from that moment on on that ship, my faith went from something that was, I, I had it in my heart because my parents had taken me to church for years. It went from my parents' faith to my faith, something that I owned out of my own relationship and experience and encounter with God. So there's two reasons I tell that story this morning. The first is, is it's not about my story. It's the more I'm in ministry, the more I hear from people constantly, again and again, of God doing things in their life that were just only God, that could only be described as God doing what God does. I hear this over and over and over again. That's why the early church said in Acts chapter 4, stretch out your hand, God, that signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus Christ, because God confirms who he is through signs, wonders, miracles, and healing, and he still does it today in the name of Jesus. That's the first reason I share that story impossible miracles. God builds our faith. And the second reason I share that story is I'm going to stand before God one day and I'm going to ask him, why did you show up on that night? Why did you show up when I had made up my mind that I was going to turn away and try out the things that the world was telling me was better? I was working for a cruise line. I won't mention the name, uh, uh, but I was working for a cruise line that they brand themselves as the party ships. Like it was not going to be very hard to try these things that the world was saying was better. God shows up and in the midst of me turning my back, reveals himself to me in this powerful way. And, and I want to say this, that this is what I believe and I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to ask him one day. But I believe it was the prayers of my parents that caused God to show up in that place and reveal himself to me in that way. I believe it was the prayers of my parents that kept me from throwing away and trashing the will of God on my life. 
Not to say that God could not have restored my mess. It's never, it's never too late to turn back to God. You know, the Bible says that God, he restores the years that have been wasted by the locust. No, he does that. But understand, I wanted to walk away from God's will. And on that night, God showed up. So I want to say on this Father's Day to the parents in the room, don't give up believing for that son or daughter that's far from God right now. Don't give up believing for that one that doesn't want anything to hear about your faith or your church. Don't give up believing for them. Don't give up. Stop. Don't stop asking God to send someone to their path. Don't give up trying to figure out how to connect to them on the path they're on. Don't give up, parent. Don't give up. For anyone in the room this morning, and you're not a parent, you say, well, how do I apply this to my life? What is there in your life you've stopped praying for? What is there in your life that you've just decided that's a bit too impossible and I'm going to scratch that off my prayer list? No, daily, your kingdom come, your will be done. In fact, I would encourage you this week, spend some time with God and say, what are three things, God, that right now seem impossible that you want me to begin to believe for again? What are three things, God, you right now that are impossible that I can start to pray for so that I can have miracles happening in my life that go beyond just, well, that, that, the prayers that, prayers that if God answered, it could only be God. There's just no way it could be anything but God. Do you know what three things are that you're asking God for that He alone can do for you? Because faith that pleases God. Faith that pleases God perseveres even though things haven't changed yet. Faith that pleases God believes even when you haven't received the miracle yet. Faith that pleases God says, I believe that you can and I'm going to trust you no matter what. Faith that pleases God is anchored in this understanding God still does the impossible and it is not up to me and you to decide when, where, or how. It is up to us to daily press into his presence and say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Today is someone's day for a miracle. And so I'm going to ask you all over the room to stand. And I'm going to ask you to just raise your hands. If you would, if you're a follower of Jesus in this place, just begin to raise your hands and just cry out to God and maybe even ask God, God, what do you want me to begin to believe for again? God, what do you want to stir up faith for in my heart today, God? What have I given up on believing for that you want me to believe for again? And in this, pres in this place, God, in your presence, we just lean into who you are and we ask you, Holy Spirit, stir up faith in our hearts. Stir up faith that goes beyond what we can comprehend, God. Stir up faith in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you can put your hands down for a moment. I believe there's some people in the room today and, and you need some people to join with you in prayer for a miracle in your life. So if you know there's a miracle that God's put on your heart today, something impossible you're believing for, whether it's a physical miracle, a financial miracle, whether it's it's healing in a, in a heart, whatever it is, if you know there's something that you want to pray for and believe God for today, would you just slip up a hand and hold it up? Just hold it up. And I'm just going to ask that those around you, if you don't have your hand raised, just look around you and see if there's anyone nearby that's got a hand up and just place a hand on their shoulder. We're going to pray together like a church family today. Would you find someone nearby you? They said they've got their hand up. Just reach out a hand, put a hand on the shoulder. It doesn't have to be weird. It doesn't have to be spooky. You can just begin to ask God. You don't even have to know what the thing is. Just begin to say, God, I pray and believe with them that today could be a day for a miracle. So God, we lift up our hands, we lift up our hearts, and we say, God, we trust in you. We place the name of Jesus over all of our problems, circumstances, and situations in our life. And we trust you, Jesus, whether or not it's been possible or whether or not we've had doubt creep in because we prayed before and not experienced it. We choose a faith posture in this moment, not because of who we are, but because of who you are in Jesus' name. We look to you, God. We say you are God of all. There is nothing that's impossible for our God, nothing that's too difficult for you. And whether we see it the way we want to or not, we believe today is the day for a miracle. We trust in you again in this place. God, we thank you for the stories that will come of what you will do and what you have done in this place. And now we return back to you, praise and thanksgiving. God, we love you. We're so thankful for who you are and all that you've done. We lift your name, Jesus, and we return back to you with worship and praise in this place. In Jesus' name, come on, church. Can we sing this out one more time before we leave this morning? Come on, sing with all you've got. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name.
me just keep your heads bowed for a moment. Yeah, there might be someone in the room today. And you've been close to making a decision for Jesus. And today in this atmosphere of great faith, you're ready. I just want to give you an opportunity today. And if you know our church, you know we won't center you out or embarrass you. That we really believe this is just an interaction between you and God. This is a faith decision. It's between you and God. But what I am going to ask you to do is raise your hand. And that's not for me or for our church. That's just to give you an opportunity to have that moment of decision where you said, that was the time when I said I'm surrendering my life to Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to count to three in a moment. And when I get to three, if today is your day to dive into a life of surrendering yourself wholeheartedly to Jesus Christ, today you're going to make a faith decision. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and say, yep, today's my day. In this atmosphere of faith, today's your day. On the count of three, we're just going to pray together after we, after you raise your hand and uh, <clears throat> believe that God will absolutely, as he says in his word, make you a brand new creation, forgive your sins, give you eternal life in Christ Jesus, and make you a brand new creation. If that's you today, you'd say, yeah, today's my day for a faith decision. Would you raise your hand one? two, three. Just shoot it up. Hold it up for a moment. We're going to pray together. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else you'd say, yeah, today's my day. Today's my day. Today's my day. Thank you, God. Come on. Let's pray together, church, with this one who's raised her hand and say this with me from your heart. Say, dear Jesus, I give you my life and I choose to follow you because I believe that you died and you rose again so I can be forgiven, free, and have eternal life. Thank you for this faith moment. Make me brand new inside. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church. Can we celebrate like we actually believe death to life just happened in this place?